I particularly like to see the freshmen because they tend to be shyer than the others. So it's nice to see them participating here. Okay, great. If we, um, I don't know if anybody wants to go first of our, our faculty presenters. Uh, any, uh, you want me to start? John, do you want to say something? Sure, I, I can start. I was just modifying my presentation a little bit. Um, do, you, do you want me to go first or? No, if I just walk, walk you know, I mean, you are as a chair of the department, yeah, yeah, of course. say hi to the students and... Sure. Um, so, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is John McCartney. I'm the department chair and I'm also a faculty member in the geotechnical area. So, um, my presentation today will tell you a little bit about um, geotechnical courses and some of the geotechnical facilities that we have here at UCSD. And um, some details from both our undergraduate program as well as our graduate program. Uh, maybe do you want to introduce each other and then we can yeah. do the presentations? Yeah, I'm, I'm Jose Restrepo. I'm a professor in structural engineering, the civil structure side of, uh, of the department. I'll be presenting you what do we do, what do you expect to do in your professional life, uh, more or less what this uh, salary range is, who wants to employ you and so on. Glad to see you all. Hi, my name is John Kasmatka. I'm a uh, professor in the Department of Structural Engineering. My research area is in the area of aerospace and composite structures. And I'm um, glad that you guys are attending to learn more about the different focus sequences. As you can see, there's, this is what really makes structural engineering unique is that we cover all aspects of structures. And so what I will do today is I'll present a little bit about aerospace and composite structures, talking a little bit on the coursework, talking a little bit about uh, your employment opportunities. And I uh, hadn't really prepared to talk about uh, salaries, but uh, I'm more than willing to answer any questions that you guys have in that area. Hey everyone, I'm uh, Professor Ken Lowe, also in structural engineering. I'm looking forward to chatting with you guys about structural health monitoring and non-destructive evaluation. And thanks for being here with us. Cool, so that's everybody, right? Okay, um, I, uh, does anybody wanna go first or should I <laughs> jump in? I have kind of a, a boilerplate presentation. How, how long were we, we gonna try to shoot for the presentation for the time limit, uh, Jennifer? 10 minutes or 15 minutes or? Uh, like uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Um, so let me share my screen. So uh, as you know, um, we have um, four to five different, uh, or four focus sequences within the department, but maybe some additional ones at the graduate level. Um, so civil structures, geotechnical systems, um, uh, structural health monitoring, and aerospace structures and composites. And then at the graduate level, we also have uh, computational mechanics. And uh, the computational mechanics at the undergraduate level comes into play in some of the elective classes that you're taking. But we have a, a separate track at the graduate level that you can specialize in. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a geotechnical engineer. Um, I've given a presentation to some of the um, SE1 classes over the years, and I, I have a couple key slides that I like to show, um, but uh, I'm not gonna go into all of the same uh, spiel that I usually give in those. Um, so the first question is what do geotechnical engineers do? You see the name geo there. So it has to do with anything involving soil or rocks. Um, but the technical side means that we're going to try to uh, come up with some mechanics-based theories to understand how they behave. Um, a little bit different than other structural materials, the soils and rocks are porous materials. 
so um, it, it's really th their strength and uh, compressibility and um, permeability all depend on like the self weight that are holding the particles together. Um, but one nice thing about soil is that there's a lot of it. It's a, an abundant building material. So we use it a lot in, in practice to solve problems. Um, we also need to, to provide the interface between structures above the ground uh, at, with a foundation. So the, the structures and the subsurface, uh, the interface is gonna be a foundation. Um, but also we can provide the interface between the aerospace structure and the ground through a, a pavement structure for uh, a, a runway. So we, we work with uh, um, these kind of structure, soil structure interaction problems, as well as just understanding the soil itself. So I, I have a whole bunch of pictures here. You can see that we deal with foundations, uh, retaining walls, keeping the soil back, um, making sure that the soil doesn't come pouring into your, your community. It's in Malibu. Um, we also work with landfills. So somebody needs to design our big piles of trash to make sure that they're stable and don't come pouring down into our, um, our communities. Um, we do a lot with um, dams. So that's uh, for flood protection, but also for um, keeping uh, water supply close to our, our communities. And we um, deal a lot with tunnels. So tunnels can be in both soil or rock. So um, if you're in that area of geotechnical engineering, you need to be very good with both materials. Um, soils are usually considered materials with no tensile strength, um, whereas rock materials could be the same minerals as soils, but they're held together by some cementation. So we have a lot of problems that we need to solve with analyses. We can't see below the ground. You have to you know, take a limited amount of data and make big decisions. And uh, this idea that you need to treat a whole bunch of different particles that are filled with fluid as either a continuum or as a, a structural network um, is a big challenge. And we, we generally just have to deal with variability. So you could build the same uh, gap closed door in every single city around the country, but all of those gap closed doors are gonna have different subsurfaces. So every project you work on is gonna be a little bit unique. Um, properties that we're, we look at in soils are the shear strength. So we don't really look at the tensile strength um, we look at the permeability, compressibility, and then other things like thermal conductivity. Um, so we have uh, four active faculty in the geotechnical engineering area and one emeritus faculty, uh, Professor Luco, who's also half structures, half soils. Um, so Professor Elgamel, Professor Hutchinson, myself, and Professor Tomatz. Um, we have three classes that uh, are at the undergraduate level. So some of you may have taken them if you're in the third year, um, but usually they, they come up in the, the fourth year in the civil structures uh, and geotechnical focus sequences. So geotechnical engineering, which I'm teaching right now is really just understanding what soils are and, and how they behave and how we can apply mechanics principles to them to solve problems. Uh, foundation engineering, this is like where you're really designing the structure that goes down into the ground. Um, we need to make sure it doesn't fail and it doesn't settle too much. And we also talk a little bit about slopes and walls in that class. And then the third class is soil improvement. Um, if you have really bad soils at a certain site that are going to have um, negative behavior under a certain type of loading, we need to come up with strategies to improve it. So those are the three undergraduate courses in geotechnical engineering. And you can imagine that that's not really enough if you want to really go into detail. In, in geotech. So we have uh, a master's program that uh, many of our students uh, decide to, to go on for a uh, MSBS or even after they just graduate, they decided they want to continue um, for a master's. So this is uh, an additional 12 courses. If you just take a course work only option, uh, you can also do a thesis option. Uh, you can focus on just regular geotechnical engineering. You can look at earthquake effects and also soil structure interaction effects. And we've kind of designed the master's program to last four quarters. And then 
the third and fourth quarters are separated by a summer where you can uh, do an internship with a local firm. Uh, so right now we have several different uh, companies that are interested in, in hiring interns over the summer. Um, so we have several different courses. So this is many more than just those three we have at the undergraduate level. Uh, we have four core courses. Um, goes in, into a little bit more detail on the soil mechanics and the foundation engineering, some testing in engineering properties, and then stability of walls, and then a whole bunch of different electives, both inside of the geotechnical area, and then also some structural ones or uh, geology ones. Um, so we're really known for soil structure interaction, even though there's only uh, four or five of us. All of us have done work on the in interaction between soils and structures, but um, a lot of us are also working in this new area of energy geotechnics. So this is anything that is involving soil where we're trying to extract energy from the ground or exchange energy with the ground. Um, so this is one of my, my pet areas. Um, it involves both sh shallow soils as well as really deep soils if you're trying to do uh, enhanced geothermal systems or compressed air storage. We have really great facilities here. So this is the old shake table. Um, it's currently being renovated. I'm sure somebody else is going to talk about it. But the thing that's interesting from the geotech side are, are what we put onto it. So we can put these cool containers that are filled with soil. Um, this is another big container. A rigid wall where we can test retaining walls. Um, we have a big pit where we can test soils or uh, this has been there for 10 years. Um, this is a heat storage system that I, I worked with. On campus we have a, a smaller shake table where we've tested some uh, bridge abutments and we've also tested some uh, lateral spreading effects of soils on foundations. And we have a centrifuge. So a lot of the times when you're building a small layer, a small model of a soil system, uh, its behavior is going to be dependent on the self weight of the soil. So if we spin it in the centrifuge, you're going to increase its self weight and you can use some scaling relationships to relate the model behavior with the prototype. And we have a little shake table. So we have the biggest shake table, outdoor shake table, and we have the smallest shake table, I think. And we have some lab places for testing materials. And we also look at some uh, interesting material, uh, test development to test challenging materials like unsaturated soils or tire shreds. And uh, some rock mechanics work. And we, we all, uh, all the faculty are involved in different types of simulations. So we work closely with the computational mechanics group. And it, if you're interested in, in geotech, we have a uh, CalGeo, which is the California based geotechnical group. And then also the ASCE Geo Institute. Uh, graduate student group. Uh, so the, the CalGeo has both undergraduates and graduates and then the Geo Institute is more focused on the graduate side of things. But they're, they always have some challenges that are welcoming undergraduates to be part of, like a, a Geo wall competition. So, so that's the Geotech presentation. I hope it was short enough. Now I'm happy to come back and answer questions later as we go along. Uh, maybe you don't want to go to uh, civil structures with Professor Estrepo. Or Ken, do you want to go next? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Jose, are you ready to go? Oh, I think we lost. I think you're on mute. I'm. I'm there. So if you want to, whatever, that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, go ahead, Jose. Go ahead. Okay. So let's do this one. So uh, good evening to, or good afternoon to everyone. Um, oh, let me put it here. So my name is uh, Jose Restrepo. I'm a professor in, in structural engineering. I, like my colleagues, I work in different areas, but my speciality is on bridges, buildings, marine structures, and all what is uh, the built environment that we can uh, build on top of, of the ground. So we tend to work with geotechnical engineers and so on. So I'm going to give you a presentation for you guys on what we do, what, what do you expect from us, some of the classes and a little summary of recent um, uh, buildings that have been built 
in, in the nation and around the world as well. So let's just start here. Um, what do we do as a structural engineering? We conceive, design, and build, and manage the construction of buildings, bridges. Um, whatever you see being built, that's exactly what we are doing. When you go on, on the freeway, you see construction or so, that's exactly the role we do. We go all the way from design, construction, project management of these, of these structures. And for us, the common denominator is safety, life safety. All what we build is, our, is, is to provide you with accommodation, but has to be safe. So in, in essence, there is a relationship with the healthy um, um, industry and us. We, we care about life safety. You can see some beautiful buildings that have been designed around the world. For example, here you see the Marine Bay Sands in Singapore designed by Arup. This one, the Petrona Towers in Kuala Lumpur designed by uh, uh, Thornton Tomasetti by Lane Joseph, who lives 45 minutes away from us here. Um, the uh, World Trade Center and the Oculus, that Santiago Calatrava beautiful structure, which is the hub for new transportation hub in New York. The stat oil, beautiful, all prefabricated, put in pieces. This is the, in Oslo, in Norway. And most of you may know, of course, this is the tallest building today is the Burj Khalifa um, that has uh, broken the record for a few years now. So what do we are? We, are, we have a prestigious, a prestigious profession. We want you to have solid basis in mechanics, in analysis, in math, and this is the reason why you are here. If you have creativity, even better, because we want you to be creative. We want you to not only to stick to a single problem, but come up with your own ideas. One of the things, the nice things of our, of our profession is that we work in different projects. Every project is different and every project will bring new and different challenges. We work closely with geotechnical engineers, engineering seismologists, uh, wind engineers, project managers, uh, it's, uh, we tend to work in a multi multidisciplinary environment to make these projects a success. So uh, I talked about buildings, but let's now talk about bridges. This is a beautiful T. Wiley bridge, and you mo mo a few of you know what this bridge is. It's a, what we call it's, it's a self-anchor um, suspension bridge it's in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland Bay Bridge and uh, was built uh, some 10, 12 years ago. We did most of the testing in our labs here. You can see parts of the, of the test uh, pieces that were new and had never been tested. So we tested them in the labs to make sure that these new pieces could go into these bridges. So we do, we work together in parallel with the design and we provide industry with uh, test results that are useful to them. You can see here a 1,000 uh, feet tall bridge in southern France. This is designed by M Michel uh, Villager. Um, a beautiful cable, um, uh, uh, cable estate bridge in southern France. Uh, it's uh, fantastic in my opinion. Uh, uh, these are the things if you are well in tune, if you're looking to have a strong vision, you can get as far as these things. And I'm going to show you an example of that. Um, here you have another cable estate bridge and you say, well, what, after seeing the Milo Viaduct, what is, what is up with this bridge? Actually, this bridge is in Greece. And one of the nice things of this bridge is that it crosses a seismic fault and has difficult foundation con uh, conditions. Uh, uh, Professor McCartney just mentioned that he works in geotechnical engineering and deals with the issue of foundation. So in this case, these foundations were actually precast they were built in dry dock, and as soon as they were partly finished, they were flooded and they were towed to position. You can see here being towed and uh, into position. And then once they are in position, you basically let water in, air out, and the foundation will sink and you finish the construction of the bridge. In this case, in this bridge, the, there was a vibration control with dampers, just like your uh, mountain bike. And those dampers were tested also here. So let's see at the dampers here and let's see the testing of the dampers in our labs. Pretty cool, pretty big stuff. Nice um, uh, devices that are used in these kind of applications. 
So let's go back to the 1960s, the Sydney Opera House. What a beautiful, beautiful structure it is. It's a rib shell with all the components, all the pieces in the roof are different. And today, of course, we can think about um, 3D printing the roof tiles, but then everyone had to be built precisely and, and put in place. Um, you can see here the details of the reinforcing steel stemming from the foundation to form the different shells. And you can see the beautiful structure and with it behind the silver, the Sydney Harbour Bridge built in the 19th century. You can also see here the Apple um, campus, which is basically seismic isolated. Look at the seismic isolation tested here in our labs. This is what is called is a friction pendulum. And 20 years ago, we didn't have this device. So this device we can say is new and has been implemented in campus. So when you have an earthquake, the building itself stays put and the ground moves around. It's very interesting. It's one way to dissipate energy and protect all what is up and built in the ground. So uh, who are we? We are, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about everyone in particular, but we are eight, eight faculty who are actively working in teaching and research. Uh, Professor Joel Conte, some of you may have taken classes with him, 125, or will be taking classes with him. Professor Michelle Morrison, who is new, and you may have taken statics or are taking statics with him. Uh, Professor Mosqueda, um, a specialist in seismic isolation. Uh, myself, uh, Professor Shin, who works in the area of masonry structures, um, reinforced concrete, finite element analysis. Uh, Professor Champras, who is new to our department, is, um, he will be taking you for classes at, at the senior level this year. Uh, Professor Van den Eyden, who is taking you for introduction to engineering and other classes. And Professor Chaoming Wang, who uh, usually teaches the steel class. What I was saying, if you look to your right, this is an 11, uh, 111 story building, and this is done by a visionary. Actually, the designer of this building was a PhD student of mine. So he had the vision to go back to Indonesia and set up a new company, and his focus was to start from the ground building small buildings, but always leaning to the tall buildings. These days, he has a boutique company, and he only designed buildings that are 40 to 100 stories tall. That's a magnificent vision over 30 years spent, which means that if you have these ideas and you have creativity and you build up your math mechanics um, and, and good understanding of the business, you can get very, very, very far. So this is, this is not unknown. So if, if you are that kind of person, you, get, you can get too far with these things and with your new ideas as well. Here, uh, it's the um, uh, course that we have for undergrad. In, in undergrads, we have 150 A and B in which you learn about structural steel. So let's look at these pieces. These pieces are prefabricated steel pieces that are welded together in the field. Look at the welding there, very tough welding. In this classes, you will learn about what is a weld, what are the pros and cons of welding. Can you, instead of welding, use bolted connections? You see here bolted bracing here in, in the same building. This is, this is the Wilshire Tower that was also designed by Len Joseph and is the tallest building west of the Mississippi is right in downtown uh, Los Angeles. So, learning about the welding, learning about the connections, um, learning about framing systems, that's all what you're going to do in 150 A and B. In 151 A and B, you're going to learn something similar, but instead of a steel, you use concrete. And you can see here the reinforcing bars and somebody putting concrete in the foundation of this bridge, of this, of this building. The foundation of this building is 30 feet solid concrete and it gets so hot that you really need to uh, 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 pour uh, or, or, or transfer the heat with um, uh, chill lines or so that you see here as well. And then you see the reinforcing bars that are going to stem all the way and provide the skeleton to that building. And it makes very people work just very, very proud of their work. I can tell you that when you go and visit these sites. So in, in oh, let me go back here. You will also see timber design in 154. In, in 140A and B, you will see the design of civil structures, which is the capstone project. 
steel and reinforced concrete. Now, at that level, when you go to the, to the capstone project, you put the elements together. What you learn in 150 and 151, we put them in projects together. So let me show you what you learn from these, from these classes. You see here uh, the construction of, um, the, in this particular case, I-5 to I-805 intersection. So you can see a lot of uh, foundation work, the construction of the bridge, and this bridge is called, is post-tension. That means that is not only concrete, so actually compresses, so it can span very long, very long distances without even cracking. In, 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 in timber design, you basically um, go and learn the typical construction in the United States, which is the, the uh, wood frame construction, but we're moving away into exciting, very exciting fields. Look at this mass timber in Canada. So we have buildings like that now in Canada. We have buildings on the, sh on, on, on the, on the drawings ready to go in Seattle of these kind of applications. It's a different from, from the traditional wood frame construction and it gives very interesting architecture. Now, uh, let me show you some of the uh, applications you will see in the capstone projects. So Professor Wang takes you to test some um, uh, uh, channel, channel beams and you test them for, lat, uh, for basically fle uh, flexural torsional buckling and you will you put a strain gauges, you measure the vibration of these, uh, of these beams and you, you basically connect some of the um, uh, knowledge that you gain in other classes in, the, in your vibrations classes, in your steel classes and you will see if, this, if, the, if what you're recording in this experiment makes sense with the theory. We also, in, in, in 140B, we go on and take the, uh, and, and do seismic design of a 12-story building with complete shop drawings. Uh, it's a little bit of work, but in the end, it's extremely useful when you get that experience and trying to find a job. And also in this class, we bring the elements back from your vibrations classes and look at the um, interaction between um, uh, a flight simulator, which is inducing vibrations on a, on, a, on a concrete slab. And we find that that concrete slab cannot really take it. So we need to retrofit and make it thicker to increase the mass. So those are elements that we learn in between the uh, theory and applications. We have every time we have a report together with shop drawings for somebody to go and build these things on the outside. And in our grad program, in case that you, you are done and you want to continue, we have a grad program that is very exciting. It takes you, again, as a component where, and, and I must say, uh, without sounding too pedantic, I, I would say is the best in, in California, if not in the nation, where you learn all the way from theory to applications. So you have several grad courses like uh, advanced structural analysis, the linear component, which is what you're doing at, at undergrad level, but expand it a little bit more. And you're going to nonlinear structural analysis, structural dynamics, which are continuations of your vibration classes, advanced structural concrete, advanced structural steel design, bridge design, masonry structures, seismic isolation. Remember, we already saw the Apple campus with isolation. We also see earthquake engineering, and advanced seismic design of structures. And there are many other courses that are incredibly supplementary with what we do, like structural stability that Professor Kosmatka teaches, an excellent class, random vibrations, cable structures. Many of the applications we have in, a structural, in, 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 our, in our field are cable structures. A structural reliability and risk analysis, computational techniques in finite elements, foundation engineering, so important. If we don't have foundation engineering, what can we do? So we, we need to understand the, the part of geomechanics and foundation engineering. And FRP in civil structures is a very interesting class because we have a bunch of old buildings that you need to mend somewhat. And we have these carbon fiber techniques today that are incredibly helpful at um, making old buildings perform okay in an earthquake. Here, by the way, for those of you who know Professor um, Morrison here, we are visiting the seismically isolated Sixth Avenue bridge, which we are doing work on it as we speak, uh, helping them with some uh, problems, troubleshooting some of the issues they have in the bridge. So we do keep an eye, uh, a, con a contact with, the, with practice. 
This building, the, this bridge is isolated here. You can see it's being cut off here, and then you have another uh, seismic isolator. Now, there are many engineering associations, but the two prime associations are the American Society of Civil Engineers and the Structural Engineers Association of California, or the little um, um, boy, which is that of San Diego. Uh, those are general, and we have material specific organizations like in concrete, we have the American Concrete Institute, or in steel, we have the American Institute of Steel Construction. We also have the Masonry Association, the Post Tensioning Institute, the Precast Pre Stress Concrete Institute, and the American Wood Council. In the end, once you finish, you complete your undergrad degree. Um, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, you will be earning, you, you could get job offers for about $65,000 in average. So that's, that's more or less what you are targeting. And after you complete a master's degree, it could be between seventy to 80000 depending if you are in San Francisco or you are in different parts of the state. And who would like to hire you? That's perhaps a question you have been asking yourself. Okay. The structural engineering companies, they can be specialized in bridges or specialized in buildings. Mainly, that those are the two main divisions. Other companies will do other things like water tanks or other things. Utility companies like San Diego Gas and Electric and, or Southern California Edison, they need a lot of structural engineers. It's, it's important for them. Engineering contractors, like, like you don't want to be in an office, you want to be uh, hands on all the time. So there is Turner, uh, Swinerton, Kiwit, Skanska, NASCO, who is building uh, ships. They're very important. They hire a lot of structural engineer, engineers. Municipalities, uh, San Diego City, Orange County, Los Angeles City or County, they hire you. A structural engineers, suppliers, and contractors say that you, you are good at selling and that's what you want to do. So you have like HRC or Sika, Hilti, Simpson, Thai, or five company. Uh, precast concrete. Now you want to be in a plant where you're precasting concrete pieces all the time. So you have a stress spray, a stress spray, Clark Pacific, Old Castle. A steel fabricators, you saw those columns that have been prefabricated and brought into the Wilshire building. So you have Russian and Shoof here in, in Southern California. Project management companies, plenty of them. Caltrans for bridge design or the military. So if, if you would like to have some more information, we have uh, in our website, we have more information for that. This presentation is going to be shared with you. Anyhow, you can click there and find out a little bit more. So in the end to uh, um, finish my presentation, I will show you here the SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles, which is being uh, finished. And you see it's basically a combination of different materials. So of course, below ground, you have all the foundations that unfortunately we cannot see. And then you have these very tall columns and sitting on this column, these black staff are the seismic isolators similar to what I showed you on the Apple campus. They, they are basically rollers or something like that. And they are basically supporting all the entire roof. It's a spectacular roof. Um, and in, above the playground itself, it's a series of uh, cables. And then you have the concrete grading. It's, it's incredibly exciting. And I would like to bring you to a, do a little short flight or drone flight with me. So. I end my presentation and I'll show you this um, um, drone video, so. You see all the cables there? Concrete grading. Steel roof base isolation thank you
John, do you want to go next or should I? Sure, sure, Ken. I think I can go and I think, I think yours will nicely fit after, after mine. Sounds great. Great. Thanks, Ken. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen and I'm assuming that everybody can now see this cover sheet. And so uh, my name is John Kosmatka, as I've mentioned previously, and I'm a professor in the area of aerospace and composite structures. And so what I'd like to do, begin by basically introducing the aerospace faculty, aerospace and composites faculty. Uh, we are basically four members. Uh, John, my, I yes. can't see your presentation. Uh, can you, you see? Can not. Am I the only one or? Here we go. Great. How about now? Yeah, How about yeah. Now? that's great. Thank you. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. Must be me. All right. So let's, let's continue on. So as I've stated, I'm John Kosmatka. My talk today will be on aerospace and composite structures. And I'll begin by mentioning our four faculty members in this area. Uh, I am interested in the area of design and analysis of composite uh, aerospace structures. And that basically focused on aircraft and spacecraft. Uh, Dr. Hione Kim is interested in uh, composite structures with a focus on repair and impact testing. Uh, Dr. Alicia Kim is interested in design optimization with applications for uh, composites as well as aerospace. And Yu Chao is interested in polymers, uh, basically developing new composite uh, materials, new composite resins. And most interestingly, tied to today's discussion is he is looking at basically using these polymers as a way of making uh, concrete for our lunar surfaces. The idea being is can we use these resins and uh, soil mixtures, let's say, from the lunar surface and from the Martian surface to basically build habitats. So hopefully by, by the end of today's presentation, you're going to see how closely tied aerospace composites is tied to geotech and tied to structural health monitoring, as well as tied to civil structures. Although they all sound very unique, uh, they all are closely tied, and that's the beauty of our structural engineering department. All right, so the first question you're asking is, what is an aerospace structure, right? I think most of you can kind of guess what it is, but I really would like to focus on the fact that it's a high performance structure and it's high reliability or maximum safety. So just like civil engineering structures are designed for reliability, aerospace structures have to be as well. Now, when you come to high performance, what you're really thinking about is low weight or volume and high stiffness and or high strength. Sometimes it's one or the other. High strength means that we're obviously trying to make a very strong, safe structure, but a very lightweight structure. That's where the composite materials comes in. And high stiffness is, is oftentimes you don't want the structure to deflect or you want it to have a very high natural frequency, right? So what is required to do this? If you want to design or build or work in this field, what you really need is advanced analysis methods, computational optimization, a lot of computer simulations. Uh, and then you need advanced materials. We're always trying to develop new materials. When you think of aluminum and titanium and carbon fiber, a lot of you have sport, sporting good structures that are based upon these. These are all developed for the aerospace industry, originally a very high cost, high performance material, but then in the end, their costs have been re reduced. And as Dr. Restrepo mentioned, these these materials have made their way into civil engineering structures as a, as a tremendous application by reducing the weight of a structure. If a structure is subjected to seismic loads or seismic accelerations, we can reduce the loads on the structure. Okay. So when you, when you look at it, most of you think of an aerospace structure as what you're seeing in the left-hand column. You're thinking of aircraft, you're thinking of launch vehicles like from SpaceX or from Boeing. These are the crew crew vehicles that take astronauts to the space station. If you find yourself reading the, uh, reading the web today or reading, the, reading the, the web yesterday about the launch from space, uh, launch of SpaceX to the International Space Station, then probably space structures might be an opportunity that you're thinking about. 
also its orbital vehicles and lunar habitats, all right? We've mentioned lunar habitats, and I'll briefly mention this shortly, but, but this is something that within your career, we're going to be having astronauts, we're going to be having habitats, not only on the moon, but we're going to have any habitats on Mars. So this is a tremendous opportunity, a tremendously exciting time to be involved with structures. And lastly, on the left-hand side, I'm showing the Seeker. This is a very innovative helicopter that was put on the Mars 2020 robot that was just recently launched. And this robot drone, if you will, is being placed onto the robot and it's going to be basically performing missions on Mars as a helicopter. Right, so it's going to be placed initially under the robot. It will be dropped onto the uh, Martian surface. The robot will pull away. This solar-powered helicopter will take off and it will perform missions, basically looking for additional sites and doing things that a much slower robot cannot do. Okay, so this again is an alternate, extremely exciting opportunity. On the right-hand column is things that you might not normally think about as an aerospace structure. But these again are basically high performance, lightweight, maximum reliability structures. So you can think about this as lightweight cars, uh, basically having carbon fiber. This could be racing cars, uh, they could be commercial vehicles, the Corvette or the Ferrari, the Lamborghinis that you're used to thinking about or aspiring to. Marine vehicles, sailboats, America's Cup boats, sporting goods, uh, which would be basically your sports structure from bicycles and golf. Uh, surfboards and energy structures such as wind turbines and lastly in the health field. Again when you think about health field you think about opportunities where we want to have a minimum weight structure and we want to be able to have examples of where our students who have graduated underneath uh, and taking classes here being focused on the aerospace structures and composites area after they have learned uh, this field and served internships with many faculty, they've gone on to work in industry in a wide variety of different fields. So I only show you this picture just because many of you are thinking, oh, when I go to the airport, all the airplanes look the same. And it's true, from a commercial point of view, a lot of the aircraft look the same. But there's continually research going on in the different aircraft examples. So if you look at the Upper left, you're seeing basically a forward swept wing. You're looking on the upper right, you're seeing a high aspect ratio solar powered aircraft. Uh, you're in the lower stream, you're seeing some of the military aircraft and high aspect ratio sailplanes. Again, none of these aircraft could actually exist without the use of composite materials. Here's something I wanna point out to you. I, I think most of you are aware of this, but if you're not aware of it, again, I'd ask you to, to Google this tonight or over the weekend or over the next couple of weeks. This is an extremely exciting time for us. So there's the, this is the, the, the Artemis program. Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. And you all remember the Apollo mission to the moon and the landing of the moon. Well, NASA has, been, has a tremendous effort of doing the Artemis program, which uh, is going to be set to, to landing back onto the moon by 2024. So when you think about that, four short years from now, so if you're a freshman, by the time you graduate, we're going to have astronauts back on the moon. That is the goal. And so if you're not a freshman, but you're a sophomore or a senior or something of that nature, these are all hiring, these are all job opportunities that are going to be beginning now and, and carrying on for the next basically 20 years. Right, this is a program to get back to the moon. A lot of these robotic missions, a lot of these CubeSats, these small satellite programs are being driven and run by student organizations and students from different universities from around the country. So the idea being is that we're gonna have astronauts back on the moon. Most of the missions early on will be from a, a female astronaut corps or an astronaut corps composed of females and males. Uh, but they will have lunar robots, uh, lunar, uh, call it UAVs, I don't like to use that word, but lunar drones, if you will, working with them while they perform their missions. Their goal is going to be on the south side of the moon, which is in the shaded, the dark side of the moon, but that's because they where the water is. And so they will be basically developing bases, base sites, using that water to be able to make rocket fuel and to provide the, the water that they, that they need for their habitats. 
And then this will be the start of what is going to be the next adventure, which is going to be the gateway adventure. Whoops, looks like I've I've taken out a slide. But the but the the, the gateway adventure is basically a habitat which will be uh, around the moon surface and basically that'll serve as the launching pad in order to get from the moon to Mars. So we can't get to the to Mars directly from Earth um, because of the gravitational pull. So what we'll do is we'll go from Earth to effectively an orbit around the moon and then from there go to Mars. And so this is the this is the vision, this is the plan. And for out your engineering career, this is an opportunity for things to aspire to. So our program is composed of six courses and three technical electives. The six courses that you're seeing are basically a SE 142, which is a design of composite structures, SE 143 A and B, which is a composite structural design, 160 A and B, which is composite structural mechanics, and 171, which is composite structures repair. I'm showing you the four year plan basically just so you can see where they fit in. Um, juniors typically would take either an SE 142 and then 160 A and B. And then in the senior year, you'll take our capstone class, which is the 143 A and 143 B. We very much focus our, our classes in terms of theory, computational work and experimental laboratories. And so I'm trying to highlight here that you can see that in nearly all of our courses, we cover uh, computational work, theoretical work, and experimental laboratories. It's only in the 160 A and B, which is really focused on the computational work and the theoretical work, that we do not have the time to cover those labs. But those, those labs are not covered in 160 A and B, they're covered into 142 and 143 A and B. And so what you're getting is the the design and analysis techniques that you're currently seeing in structural mechanics, and we're applying them now for very lightweight structures. So just to give you kind of a brief summary, on the left here, I'm showing you kind of an overview of the classes. So on 160 A and B, we focus on the theoretical development, the ability to process the aerodynamic loads, place the aerodynamic loads or propulsion loads or vibration loads onto our structure, go ahead and do a structural design and an analysis, determine its margin of safety, its reliability, and basically come up with the design and analysis techniques. This is hand calculations through MATLAB calculations all the way through finite element work. In 142, which is the second row, you can see students here working together to basically learn how to fabricate and build things with composites. And these are basically just small uh, plates and shells and tubes. And, and there's uh, design competitions within this class. The third row basically focuses on the composite repair classes where students learn that after you design and build a structure, you have to be able to repair it or you have to be able to bond and join it. And lastly, in the, in the final row, this lowest row, that is basically just a brief summary of what we do in 143 A and B. So each year the students are given a different uh, design competition and the students then pretty much compete against with each other. We run this capstone class exactly the way you would do it in industry, meaning that we release an RFP, the students break up into teams, they, from their teams they come up with a design uh, solution where they're doing a lot of uh, pre-design calculations. They then have a preliminary design review where we bring in industry people from SpaceX and from General Atomics, Boeing, Northrop Grumman. So professionals, engineers come in to evaluate the students' work. Many of those engineers are former students who are now working at these big companies. After that, we perform a critical design re re review after they've done all of their detailed analysis. And then finally, the students fabricate the structure and then the structure gets tested. In this year's application that we're showing here in the pictures, this was a UAV wing and the students had to design, analyze and build it and then test it. And you can see on that picture on the right hand side, the, uh, after the loading is applied and the loading is a load that simulates the aerodynamic loads, uh, basically you can see the large deflection that it takes before failure. So I think this would be a good time to just mention 
is that, you know, Dr. Restrepo mentions the vibrations, uh, and, and vibrations is very critical for aerospace structures. It's a perfect field where, where, where both um, engineers in, in civil structures and aerospace structures work together on, on these types of problems. Uh, vi vibrations is the leading cause of failure on an aerospace structure, either because of resonance or fatigue or basically flutter. This is a fluid-induced uh, vibration of the structure, something that would be also common in bridges. And uh, on the right-hand side, I'm showing you some of the student organizations that our aerospace structure students belong to. And this is the AIAA, which is the Aeronautics and Astronautics Club on campus. They have a design, build, and fly where they uh, design and build aircraft, and then they compete against universities from all around the United States and international universities. And our uh, students have always done very well uh, in these competitions, one time uh, winning the, the complete whole United States competition. AUVSI is the autonomous version of this. So students are designing and building drones, if you will, their unmanned aircraft, and then they have to fly fully autonomously to perform a mission, right? So they have to identify targets, locate the targets, and then uh, perform a mission to basically save people, if you will, at these targets. And lastly, on this campus, they have a very good SAE Formula One competition team. The aerospace structure students typically take responsibility for doing the composites and the design of the, uh, of the, of the structure for the race car. So where do our students go to graduate? Most of them go to graduate either in government, which would be, for example, for the Navy, for the Air Force, or for NASA, or they go to work for some of the larger uh, aerospace companies. Our, our, uh, our students are highly sought after by many of the large companies. Most of them will end up doing internships between their junior and senior year, and then after that, uh, they will go on to take a full-time position at one of these companies. And so it could be an aircraft. Like I mentioned, there's Boeing, which is predominantly, you could think of them as being in Seattle, but they have a very large uh, number of different organizations here in Southern California where they do not only aircraft, but they do a lot of spacecraft and rockets. General Atomics, which is here in San Diego, they do a lot of unmanned aircraft. Northrop Grumman does not only unmanned aircraft, but they do a lot of rockets and uh, military aircraft as well. SpaceX, you're probably fully aware of. They are in uh, Hawthorne, California, which is uh, just near the airport at LAX. And we have a number of students who work there as well. Um, I think you're gonna find that most of these companies, for example, at General Atomics, the uh, head of structures is a UCSD grad. At Boeing, a wide variety of engineering managers as well as engineering researchers are UCSD grads. At SpaceX, I have a number of graduates who work there. The head of the loads analysis, uh, heads of manu composite manufacturing are UCSD grads. So there's a strong alumni um, base out there who are more than willing to help you with your career plans. And lastly, uh, on, on the right-hand side is NASA. Uh, State of California is blessed to have three uh, NASA research facilities in the state. We have JPL, which is up in Pasadena. Most of you know about them from their robotics work on Mars. Uh, we have the Flight Research Center, the Armstrong Flight Research Center, excuse me, which is in Palmdale. All of the X airplanes that you always hear about, they're always designed and built and flight tested there. And fi finally, NASA Ames, which is right outside of Stanford in the Mountain View area. They have the large wind tunnels that you see on your way up to San Francisco and they basically do a lot of aerodynamics work. So um, I think I probably run out of my 10 minutes. I'll just go through and show just a couple of slides just to talk about the 143 because our capstone class, like I said, really tries to pull a lot of this information together. Students, by the time they, they leave, uh, have got a thorough understanding of aircraft structural design and composite fabrication, and these are the uh, goals that industry likes. I will say that I don't believe that there's any other program in the, all of the United States that covers this type of material on an undergraduate basis. Uh, this is all 
uh, typical universities, you would might see one class like this on a graduate level, but nothing like this on an undergraduate level. For example, at Stanford University, basically students just put together a small six inch by six inch as a graduate student panel, but nothing like this where students are, are completely fabricating, in this case, a wing. And then with this wing that they fabricated, then they will continue and we'll do the full scale testing like I'm showing you here. And then they test it until the aircraft fails. And the beauty of this class is there's a lot of detailed finite element work that is done after the failure so that the students are given the opportunity to understand why it has failed and why their uh, models may not have worked as they had planned. These final slides, which I'm just gonna just scroll through quickly, these are just some of the research efforts of some of our faculty. This is Dr. Hione Kim's work, and he looks at impact of aircraft structures, and it could be impact from basically a, a blunt effort on a cart, or it could be actually from, from ice. Uh, here are some of his high-speed uh, work. This is high-speed work, basically doing ice work within a, uh, ice work being shot out of a, uh, a penetrating gun. This is some of the work that I've been doing, and these are wings that are typically fabricated here at UCSD for full-scale testing. And we do structural health monitoring, which is Dr. Lowe's uh, area. Uh, and a lot of these efforts are applied to aircraft vehicles. So this is UAV testing that is done at UCSD. If you look on the lower right-hand picture, you can see myself buried in there, just to show you kind of the size of the aircraft. This is a large UAV for Northrop Grumman. And these are also just some additional research testing that's done at the Powell Structures Lab. And finally, this is work that we're currently doing with NASA Armstrong, which are basically developing smart wings or wings that basically deform so that we can get better flight performance. All right, so with that, I've completed my talk. I will uh, turn it over to, to Dr. Lowe, and I will gladly answer any questions that you have at the uh, end of the discussions. Ken, you should be ready. Yep, thanks, John. Appreciate it. Can everybody see my slides okay? I guess after I go to presentation mode. All right, nobody complains. I assume everything looks good. So, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken. Um, happy to be here to talk to you a little bit about structural health monitoring and non destructive evaluation. Uh, before I begin, I thought I'd take this opportunity to introduce some of the other faculty members in our department. Uh, the main core group, I guess, in the SHM and NDE area. So we have uh, Professor Chuck Farrar on the bottom left, and then going right, uh, Francesco Lanza di Scalia, Chin Xiong Lo, and as well as uh, Mike Todd. Um, but like Professor Kosmaka just said, many of us uh, cross over into other specialties within structural engineering. So for instance, Professor Kosmaka does some work in uh, structural health monitoring as well, as well as Professor Conte, so on and so forth. Now, before I jump into uh, some of the slides that I want to show, share with you today, you know, I thought this uh, session came together really nicely. You know, as you saw from the beginning, we didn't really have an agenda in the sense that there was no pre-planned order. But I think all of us, you know, back in the back of our minds, were kind of in agreement, right? We started with the discussion on foundations, right? You can't start anything without foundations. Professor uh, Jose Restrepo and Professor Kasmaka shared with you all the types of uh, structures that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, which may be on the ground or, or up in the air. And, you know, if you've been around long enough, um, you know, and, and the reason I'm going last is because, well, at the end of the day, you care about looking and feeling good and preventing death, right? And, and to some sense, you know, half-jokingly, SHM and NDE is very much related to that. So, you know, like all, all the other professors just mentioned, Right. As structural engineers, and especially in this department, we are concerned with all sorts of different types of structures. Right? The goal is to equip you with the knowledge and the tools that allow you to design, analyze, build, and manage, like Professor Restrepo said, all these different types of infrastructure systems, all the way ranging from civil structures to aerospace to mechanical systems and rotorcraft. But we know that once these structures are in service, especially after they've been around for a while, things can happen to them. And in particular, they can be subjected to extreme events or degradation throughout their entire service lifetimes, right? So civil structures are exposed to natural disasters like flooding, right? Which can cause their failure. 
We have extreme loads such as due to impact, envir environmental effects such as corrosion, or even just repetitive loading, right, such as vibrations um, and cyclic loads that are commonly seen in our mechanical and aerospace type of structures, as well as civil structures too. And when these extreme loads occur, uh, they do induce damage and can potentially cause uh, failure to the entire system, right, which jeopardizes their functionality as well as their life safety. So from, from, from the perspectives of the need in, in, in the structural engineering field, right, we know that all these different types of structures and materials and components can sustain some type of damage, right? And if these damaged features go undetected, they can propagate to cause ultimately catastrophic structural failure, right? As shown in this picture on the right, where this composite rudder failed in flight. Unfortunately, the plane didn't crash. So from the perspectives of what we need to do is, we need to be able to intervene in a timely fashion to catch these early signs of issues and hopefully be able to address them or repair them so that the structure remains in their uh, top-notch performance. So the grand challenge of not just structural health monitoring and NDE, if you will, um, but really for, for all areas of, of engineering is, you know, how can we get relevant data from our structures, both in the temporal as well as spatial domains, so that we can fully understand their performance and be able to uh, characterize their health and performance to facilitate making decisions on how to best operate them in an efficient and safe manner. Now, in the context of the, these physical assets that we've looked at so far, such as our, our buildings and bridges and airplanes and, and automobiles, right, structural health monitoring really embodies these three main core areas, right? So the first of which is sensing. Once a structure is out, performing what, it's, what it needs to do, whether it be a plane or, or a building, right? We need to characterize how it's interacting with the environment, right? So being able to not only pick, but also design the right sensors so that we can collect uh, the, the relevant data streams are critical. So in a very general sense, Pro uh, Professor Francesco Lanza di Scalia and I work in this area. Once we get all this data in hand, especially over long periods of time, right? We need to be able to analyze that data to understand for this specific structure and its intended performance and functionality, is it performing the way that it's, it's meant to, right? And specifically using that data to be able to detect issues that occur uh, that could potentially jeopardize its, its performance. And last but not least, right, once we've detected anomalies or issues, we need to be able to diagnose, right, what, what, what the problem is and essentially come up with a treatment plan. What, what are we gonna to do to, to rectify the situation, right? And that could involve uh, taking the structure offline, performing repairs, you know, dealing with it a month from now, or you know, having to shut it down or, or take, it, take it apart, right? And hopefully through this entire process, we are more knowledgeable about how our structures interact with this built environment so that we can facilitate the design of higher performance structures in the future, like uh, Professor Kasmaka just mentioned. Now, when it comes to SHM and NDE, as the name suggests, there's two integrated approaches here, right? And, uh, you know, if you own a car, you know, you're actually more familiar with this area than you might already know. So the first of which is NDE or NDI, right? Non-destructive evaluation and non-destructive uh, inspection. So typically this involves uh, taking the structure offline, using some type of technology to excite the structure and to measure its response. Right? And it could be by sending an ultrasonic wave or some sort of vibration to the structure, structure and just listening to, to how the structure responds to that particular excitation. At the same time, right, by listening, we need to, to, to have some sort of instrumentation to be able to acquire those signals, to be able to process that information. And ultimately the goal is to detect damage or, or problems that may be present in the structure, right? Um, unsuitable vibrations, you know, a chip uh, in a gear or a, a big crack in a, in a railroad track. Now structural health monitoring on the other hand is also very similar to this process with the exception that SHM is meant to be an online process, meaning that it, it lives and breeds with the structure throughout its entire service lifetime. 
So typically sensors and other uh, measurement tools or, or even excitation methods are integrated with the structure, structural system uh, during design and fabrication so that it continuously measures parameters related to how the structure is interacting with its environment. Through all the data that we're getting, we have to process that, uh, you know, this big data set, be able to extract relevant features and hopefully be able to quantify essentially how the structure uh, is behaving. And of course, the goal is not only to detect issues, but to tie that back into structural performance, right? And, and to look at not only its current performance, but how it would, how certain issues would impact its future behavior, right? So that we can come to some decision as to whether or not a structure needs to be repaired or if it needs to be uh, pulled offline right away. So this is very much similar to owning and operating a car, right? You know, as you're driving, right, you have all these sensors built into your car that's able to monitor things like your tire pressure, your, uh, your uh, coolant temperature, right, engine performance, your fuel, right? And if there are issues that happen along the way, right, there's probably some sort of prompt that would tell you that, you know, this could be a problem that you need to take a look at. And when you take it in the shop, right, when, you're, when your car's offline, the technicians perform NDE or NDI on it. Right, being able to non-destructively remove certain components to take a deeper look. Now here at UC San Diego, right, and, and for SHM and NDE, you know, our goal is to equip you with an interdisciplinary knowledge related to those three main areas that I keep repeating myself throughout the talk so far, right, and that is in sensing technologies, right, how do you get those measurements? Data interrogation, and that is how do you process all that data that you're getting? Right? We live in a world where we have so much data today. And last but not least, being able to analyze that data and tying that back to the structural system that you care about. So this requires not only knowledge about modeling techniques, but it also uh, requires you to have a solid grasp of mechanics, especially in relation to the type of structure that you're dealing with at the end of the day. What's very cool about SHM and NDE is that you know, the, the the fundamental knowledge that we're, we're, we're teaching you allows you to apply them in all sorts of different types of structures, right? Ranging from civil, mechanical, aerospace, to marine engineering. And we're, we're looking at a structure, not just at one particular phase, but really to support this design to retirement lifecycle management of systems, right? To look at it, its entire, you know, uh, sort of uh, cradle to grave um, uh, time span. Now, of course, you know, like uh, all the other subdisciplines in our department, right, the, at the undergraduate level, our goal is to not only get you excited about this particular specialization, but to give you a taste of uh, an appreciation of the complexities involved with SHM and NDE, right? And if, if you so desire, we also have a one-year master's program specifically dedicated to structural health monitoring and non-destructive evaluation. So as with most master's programs, there's the coursework option or comprehensive option or the thesis option. But regardless of what track you choose, right, you, you're taking core courses that teach you the basics of NDE and SHM. And then you have the flexibility in choosing uh, different courses from those three areas that I mentioned before, sensing technologies, data interrogation, modeling analysis. But the idea in, in both tracks is to allow you to have some hands-on experiences, whether more deeply in research or closer to practice on, what SH, on, on how SHM and NDE is applied in the field. But you know, specific to our discussion today, right, at the undergraduate level, you know, the SHM and NDE focus sequence uh, consists of these five main courses that uh, you can choose from. Right, so, and, and they cover uh, those three, three areas that I, that I just mentioned before, right? So you have courses in NDE and sensors, uh, which I teach, structural health monitoring that uh, Professor Farad teaches, uh, 167 in signal processing and data analysis, so that's Professor C.H. Lowe's, and then uh, SC168 uh, in structural system testing and model correlation, that's Professor Mike Todd's class. Now, if you, if you do desire to pursue a, a master's degree or even a PhD in, in SHM and NDE, there are a lot more advanced courses that you can you know, really 
dive into and, and wrap your head around. Now here at UCSD, you know, it's actually very rare to have uh, sometimes even just one faculty working on SHM and NDE. We're very blessed to have five core faculty in this particular area, all co-located within one department, right? And all of us are, are very research active. Uh, we're well connected with not only our, our government sponsors, but also uh, our, our, our practitioners and, and stakeholders. So these pictures are, are taken on campus in uh, the various professors' labs uh, earlier this year, just in January, right before the pandemic. Right, so it gives you a taste of uh, not only your, your potential work environment, um, but sort of the types of things that you might be able to do. Right, so this is a, a big wind turbine project led by uh, Professor Francesco Lanza di Scalia. Right, this is Professor Todd's lab. This is, uh, um, I believe, also Professor uh, uh, Lanza's lab, where he's looking at detecting uh, damage in, in composite structures in collaboration with Professor Connie Kim. Right, we work with lasers, 3D printers, uh, different imaging technologies. And in a lot of the courses that I mentioned, uh, there's a, there's a, a strong hands-on component associated with that, very similar to some of the aerospace capsule design courses. Right, so in my sensors class, there's a physical laboratory where you're playing with different instrumentation, different sensors, and being able to collect data uh, from, from test structures, right? And then same in uh, Professor uh, Todd's system, uh, structural system validation course, right? There's a, a testing component to try to get data so that you could then analyze and, and extract features related to that. So last but not least, um, I'm sure most of you are wondering, well, what exactly can I do with a specialization in structural health monitoring and NDE, right? Well, in a very general sense, you know, I would answer that question by saying that, well, we're really training you with a background in this particular area so that it allows you to answer these types of questions, right? Such as, how can I assess the performance of a system, particularly once they're deployed in the field? How and what can, data can I acquire, right? Because once they're in the field, right, you don't, you don't know that your structure is being loaded by a 20 kip force at point B. Right? You're, you're really stepping away from the textbook and really looking at very complex interactions with the environment. Right? So you, typically we need to measure what type of loads are being applied to your structure and in different uh, conditions. Once you have all that data, right, how do I extract relevant information from, from the sea of data that we're collecting? And last but not least, what decisions can I make from the spatial and temporal information extracted? Right? Some of our, our bridges and buildings are in service for 60, 80, 100 years, right? And you might have data that span that entire uh, time scale, right? How do you deal with that, right? Do we just look at trends happening, you know, 50 years ago versus right now, but the loads may have changed on a bridge, right? It used to be horses, now we're, you know, driving big trucks over it. Now, to be more specific, right? I think once you have a background in SHM and NDE, right, you can, uh, find many job opportunities in private industry, government, as well as the military, right? And then, like I said early on in the talk, the, one of the key selling points of SHM and NDE is that you're equipped with these fundamental tools that allow you to tackle engineering problems in all sub-disciplines of structural engineering. So here I list aerospace, automotive, civil, geotech, industrial, so on and so forth, right? But the key is, you know, you have a way, you have knowledge that allows you to not only measure data or sense how the structure is behaving, analyze uh, and extract features, but also make decisions, right? But a key, key way to succeed <clears throat> with a background in SHM and NDE is to have a solid grasp of structural mechanics, being able to take all that and apply it back to analyzing your, your structural system, right? Whether it be a plane or a bridge or an under, uh, underground pipe. So just to give you some examples of some of the career pathways, right? Folks have uh, joined companies and, and uh, groups that uh, Professor Rostropo and uh, Kasmaka mentioned earlier, uh, but specifically when, within those big companies, right? They can take on jobs related to forensic engineering, failure analysis, quality assurance and control, process or system monitoring, data science and analytics, um, as well as very, various types of consulting gigs. So with that, you know, I wanted to keep this short, so I'll stop there. And I think, I believe I'm the last one. So on behalf of all the faculty, uh, let me just say 
thank you all for attending. And I think we're all happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hi, Professor Lowe, I have a question for you. Can you see me yeah. and hear me? Okay, yes. cool. Uh, a lot of people well, are names on the screen. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, I'm, um, I'm a second year uh, structural engineering major, of course. I'm curious that, um, like in your career slide, for your last slide, it looked like a lot of the careers were like very related to the, the career slide on the civil engineering presentation. So I'm curious, like, say you have a focus in structural health monitoring, like how would your typical day in the job be different than someone who has like just a degree in, um, I guess, design of civil structures? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and I'll take a stab at it first and maybe uh, uh, Professor Escrepo can jump in as well. Um, but I think in general, right, in these very large companies, um, you, every person plays a very unique role, right? You can start with, um, you know, you mentioned a, a structural a designer, right? Where you're looking at all the loads being applied to your structures, your potential structure, and you have to, you know, come up with a, a design that not only meets the serviceability requirement, but also the life safety requirement, right? Now, now from a SHM and NDE perspective, right? Where a, a big part of that is, looking at now that you have your existing structure, right? How is it interacting with its environment, right? So being able to take measurements from the field about that specific structure, be able to analyze it and to extract uh, information about not only entire structure, but also the components to assess whether or not the, the structure is still sound, it's still safe, right? Are there any issues? I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So. Oh, uh, so, so I, I, I can say a little bit more uh, um, also supplemental um, Professor Lowe's. In, in large companies like Arup or <laughs> Skidmore, uh, uh, Thornton Tomasetti, IACOM, uh, they would like to have a small groups that are specialized on sensing. So uh, you could be spending the time to design uh, the, um, the instrumentation for a bridge or something you may want to monitor to see the health status of that bridge or component or so or monitor over the long time or say you have an earthquake and you have a failure so you want to look at failure analysis all the way from um, what happened to the materials the uh, concrete or reinforcing steel or um, the soil type. So there is many applications. I, I would foresee that many of these applications involve uh, quite a bit of time in the field, uh, placing and sensing, and then getting back into the office, looking and processing the data, depending on how big your group is or so. Great, thank you. And thanks for kicking, off, uh, kicking us off with questions. I had a question regarding classes for the next few quarters. How is that going to look for all of us who are supposed to be remote? Um, I suppose I can comment on that. So it's definitely looking like the um, winter is probably going to be uh, mostly remote, but with some hybrid courses. Um, we're trying to make sure that all of the lab uh, heavy classes have an in-person uh, class. Uh, component, um, but also a remote component in case you're not able to make it. Um, I think everybody's hoping that <laughs> by spring things are going to get better, but it, it's always we're, we're just uh, trying our best to to keep everybody healthy and and make sure you guys are getting the information you need. So it, it's complicated. Gotcha. Well, thank you for answering. Your kids are cute, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> just one son. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was I was called. <laughs> Hold up. <laughs> Hi, so, um, so I have a question for John um, Penta. I believe you're um, the one who were talking about um, aerospace um, right here. Uh, yes. How so yeah, so um, my, so I just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mr. Minter, um, 
Mission Men Boy. So I'm part of the NRTC program over here at San Diego. And my thing is that I, as much as I want to become a naval officer, I still want to have that background and um, experience. It's basically, um, going through this aerospace sequence and after commissioning and after going through there for um, extended time, actually co coming back to the professional field. But as um, the by, by that point, um, I'll only be able to have a, like a master's, I mean, a bachelor's in um, social engineering with the focus, focus season. What would you say um, I should prepare? Well, so let me, let me ask you, um, what do you envision that you'll be doing for the Navy? Do you envision yourself doing aircraft work? Or do, you, do you see yourself being a pilot? Uh, in, in the San Diego area, a lot of the Navy bases are focused on the actual facilities itself. And so this could be uh, buildings, structures, bridges like, like that. Uh, and there's obviously, there's the, uh, uh, some of the uh, engineers in working in those fields. So if you can kind of help me to under, understand what your goals are within the Navy, I can help you answer your question. Yes, sir. So um, the my main goal as of right now is potentially go nuclear with subs. And the second and probably really close to that is also pilot. But I placed that second because I wasn't as sure if I could um, meet the physical requirements to do that. But Besides that, um, the goal is just to go through the sequence over with structural engineering for four and a half years so that I'll give like an encompassing understanding of it, as well as taking courses over in some of the um, May, uh, May sequences, such as I think um, there's one like May, May 155A or something like, and something like that. I am not too sure at the moment, and that's why I've been consulting with the depart department, uh, undergrad department advisor, Ms. Eller, and also just emailing professors and uh, see what I can really do. All right, well, let me see if I can try to answer that as quickly as possible. So MAE 155 A and B, that's the uh, aerospace engineering capstone sequence. And in, in that sequence, you would be an MAE or an aerospace engineering student. We're getting a, uh, a large number of, of students who are in a MAE wanting to take our 143 A and B aerospace structures capstone design class. So I would strongly to just say to be patient and as the courses evolve and as you evolve here, I think you'll find that the 143 A and B uh, will, will meet your goals. Now, having said all of that, when you start talking about uh, nuclear subs, uh, then you should also be thinking that Professor Ken, Ken Lowe doing structural health monitoring, that is a, a tremendous concern and a tremendous need to do health monitoring and prognosis uh, for submarines which are under sea for a very long period of time, six months at a, at, a, at a tour, if you will. If you are thinking about becoming a pilot, then by all, all means, um, the aerospace structures uh, is in a perfect opportunity for you to be in, uh, as well as let's say structural health monitoring. Those are both opportunities for you. Uh, so again, I I think uh, it's I will tell you from our previous students who have been involved uh, with our program and the Navy. I think it's harder to get into the uh, nuclear field than it is to get in, into flight school at, at times. So so those are both tremendous challenges. So I definitely applaud you for for going after those very highly competitive positions in the Navy. But uh, I think you'll find that the aerospace structures is an opportunity that you might want to consider. All right, thank you, sir. So I'll um, continue adding on to that and hopefully be able to discuss with you or um, more advisors in the future to create some sort of um, strong plan. And over time, it'll perhaps have to um, change and I'll be willing to adapt to that as necessary. Great, good luck. If I may add one point to that too, I think, uh, you know, Professor Kasmaka said it right, there's, especially in San Diego, there's many different types of naval careers that you can pursue. Um, so one example, uh, and, and one specifically that we work with are the folks down at North Island at Never. So, you know, they have uh, huge problems with a lot of their composite components in their F-18 Super Hornets, for instance. So we have a project looking at how do we come up with a imaging tool that allows to see beneath the surface, you know, where there are cracks or, or delaminations, right? So um, I, I bring that to your attention just because, you know, from the structural perspective, right, you have all the, all sorts of structures ranging from ships to planes to subs to, to physical, you know, surface infrastructure as well. 
Yeah. So, so my suggestion is to, yeah, talk to a lot of people and, and, you know, think about uh, potential directions that you could take. Got it. And sorry if I'm asking too much, but um, I just want one, one final input was that um, because of my career choice and path, um, there um, there will still be a place where um, either after after the career or during the career where I can, even though I would be um, part of the subs, um, that I would, what's called, um, find um, integration of aerospace structures as a part of um, that field as well. Oh, absolutely. When you think about the subs themselves, if, if, you, if you step back from the nuclear power plant, but you look at the vehicle itself, uh, the submarine itself, when you think about the hydrodynamic loading on the vehicle, the vehicle shape, and then also the, uh, the performance of the vehicle, it really is like an aerospace structure. You see it has a, a hull, which is basically a thin skin. You then see the, all of the stringers and the frames inside. Uh, it is pretty much a, like a classic aerospace structure. So the structural analysis techniques that we apply and we would teach you, which have been used by other students to do, let's say, the America's Cup sailboats, would also apply directly for submarines. That should be more than enough. Thank you, sir. Use, use this opportunity to get, you know, to get to know uh, Professor Kosmarka and, and Professor Lowe even further. So write to him, write to them, and maybe you can integrate with the grad students and get to know what they do. I think is, is one of the reasons why we are here. So we, 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 we break that distance that sometimes is between you guys and us. Very well stated. Hello. I have a question about intern op internship opportunities or career opportunities for um, SC aerospace students. I'm, uh, I'm kind of curious on how these opportunities do come up since structural engineering is closely associated to civil engineering. Oh, my friend, my friend, what do you mean it's, it's, it's related to civil engineering? It's all types of structures. So why, why did I come here? I came here because you are historically correct in that I went to, I, when I graduated, I went to work for uh, a, a couple of different aerospace companies. And in those aerospace companies, they were predominantly civil engineers. And aerospace companies love to hire civil engineers because they see more structures than an aerospace engineer would see or a mechanical engineer would see. And so from a historical perspective, you are absolutely correct. Uh, but. But what we have developed here, and one of the reasons why I came to this university to help develop this structural engineering program, is that we were gonna do all types of structures. And from a student's perspective, the student would be able to train themselves and recognize that it's really the loading and the boundary conditions, the attachments, the foundations, that's really the, the, the change, if you will. And so I would, I would proudly say that no matter what field you choose, you could always at some point in your career or even right after graduation, you could work in one of these other, other fields as, as well. I will tell you that uh, aerospace companies like to hire our aerospace structures engineers, but they also like to hire civil structures engineers and they like to hire SHM students as, as well. So don't, don't think that this is some scary that you, topic that you have to choose one field. I think, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's as critical as you would think. Now to answer your original question on, on internships, uh, there are a wide variety of internships um, that, that you can choose for. Some of them you can, you can work with uh, faculty, some of them you can get information from other students, otherwise you can just apply on, online. Uh, for example, SpaceX loves to hire students between their sophomore junior year and junior senior year and they would prefer that they hire you on an internship as opposed to hiring you after you graduate. They like the opportunity to look you over and make a decision, and then they invite you for a full-time job after graduation as opposed to hiring somebody um, with, without having been seen. So there's a wide variety of companies in the San Diego area as well as in Southern California. And we could go on and on and talk about it. And, and I would think the most important thing I could ever advise you to do is do really well in your classes. And if you, you need to do more than that, you need to also demonstrate that you can lead. So if you get involved with an engineering club or an engineering activity or do an internship in one of these professors laboratories, uh, either during the school year, during the summer, all of those are fantastic stepping stones to getting your career started. Okay. I, hope 
Hope I, I answered your question. Those. Thank you very much. Yeah, if in doubt, send send me an email and I can I can always discuss this a little bit further with you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Tim, let, let me add a little bit. If you see Professor Champers did a, a PhD and he's a civil engineer and did a PhD in um, earthquakes and yet he ended up working for a SpaceX and has recently joined us as a professor. So you see that if you have the solid a solid knowledge of mechanics and maths, you can switch. It's not that difficult to switch from one field to another. So there are no, these barriers are, are non-existent as long as you follow what Professor Kosmatka say. You, you keep good grades, you understand the basis, and you try to do one step at a time, participating in activities that really, op all those three, um, um, if you do well in all three phases, you basically open up doors anywhere else. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll definitely take that advice. Thank you. So um, looks like we're a bit over time and I want to thank um, our faculty, professors Restrepo, McCartney, Lowe, and Kozmaka for presenting and answering questions. Um, and I'm going to stop the recording. Um, and if any faculty can stay on until maybe 645, we can answer a few more questions, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Sure, I can, I can gladly.